Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody this evening. Glad you were able to come tonight and be in our Bible study this evening. Good to see y'all. Good welcome to those who have joined us on Facebook. Glad you're with us tonight uh, as well. Let's get our Bibles and open to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 13 through 18. I actually finished this up, but I wanted tonight to talk about um, nine arguments that present a strong case for the pre-tribulation rapture. And I'll talk more about that once we get into it. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse. I'm going to read again the passage that this is in, in verses 13 through 18, and we'll get into that. Uh, when we pray tonight, don't forget to pray for Angela. She is going to have a stress test and a echocardiogram. Also, uh, Carly, uh, that's Lisa um, Taunton's um, daughter. She fell today at cheer camp and uh, fractured her arm. So she got to see an orthopedic doctor to so pray for her. Uh, it's the same arm she injured when she was a little girl, Lisa said. So pray for them. Also, continue praying with James. He's doing really well. James is doing good, so we praise God for that. Uh, lift up Miss Vicki Trussell to you and pray, uh, praying for her um, and all the others too we have on our prayer, uh, prayer list we pray for. Okay? All right, let me read the passage and then we'll pray and we'll get into our study tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 13. Let's hear from the word of the Lord. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, also, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the public reading of the Scriptures tonight, and I pray that you bless the reading and the pre preaching and teaching of your Word tonight for your honor and for your glory. I pray, Father, that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit and allow me tonight to be able, Lord, to preach and teach the Scriptures accurately and rightly to expound upon your word for your glory. I pray, God, that you help those who are here and those who are watching. Give them wisdom and understanding with the word, Lord, I pray. And God, help us to take what we hear, apply in our lives, and be able to use it to minister to others and to teach others as well. We pray, God, that you be with those in our prayer list. And we lift up all those to you, Lord, who are sick tonight and hurting. We pray for your healing hand to be upon them and touch them, Lord Jesus. Bless those who are grieving, we pray, with peace and comfort that only you can give. And we thank you for that tonight. Lord, we love you and we give you praise and glory, thanking you for this precious promise we have in this passage that we've been studying over the last few Wednesday nights, that Jesus, you have promised that you've gone to prepare a place for us, and you will come again to receive us unto yourself, that where you are, there we may be also. We praise you for that and we thank you for that. Now have your way tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's different viewpoints on when the rapture is going to happen. Uh, there's the pre-tribulation view, which what I believe and what I teach. That, that means or says that the rapture takes place before the tribulation period starts. That Jesus will rapture the church and then the tribulation begins and we will be in heaven with Christ during the tribulation and we come back with Christ at his second coming. That's the pre-tribulation view. Then there's a mid-tribulation view view of the rapture where they believe that the rapture will happen at the middle of the tribulation. The tribulation is seven years. And the first three and a half years are going to be pretty much peaceful time. And the Antichrist, you know, he's going to sign the peace treaty with Israel uh, as Daniel, the prophet Daniel, prophesies in his book in the Old Testament. And then at the middle of that seven year peace treaty he signs with them, uh, three and a half years, he's going to go in and break his own peace treaty with them, his covenant with them. And he's going to set himself up as God in the temple in Jerusalem that they have, they're going to rebuild there in Jerusalem. And in the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation is known as the Great Tribulation, which Jesus calls that in Matthew 24. Uh, and he says it's a time that the world's never seen before nor ever will see again. It's going to be so bad that if it wasn't shortened, even the elect wouldn't be saved uh, in, in that time. That's how bad it's going to be. 
And so the, the mid-tribulation rapture believers, they believe that at the three and the first three and a half year of tribulation, the church will be here, and then we'll be raptured right when the Antichrist does what he does by breaking his covenant. And that's when Jesus will rapture the church, and we'll come back with Christ at the second coming. Then there's the post-tribulation rapture believers. They believe that the rapture happens at the second coming. And when Jesus comes back at the second coming, that's when he will rapture the church. So that's the three main, the three views of when the rapture takes place. And tonight I'm going to teach why I believe that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. Now I said this when I first started teaching this passage here in verse 13. I've said it here before every time I get to a scripture that deals with uh, the second coming of Christ or the rapture of the church. I always say this, that what you, how you view the rapture does not determine whether you go to heaven or not. It has nothing to do with your salvation, okay? We are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, our faith is to be in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. Uh, so if a believer believes in the pre-tribulation as I do, or if they believe in the mid-tribulation, or they believe in the post, that doesn't have anything to do with your salvation, okay? I don't teach that, I don't preach that, so I, if you disagree with me, you, I'm not saying that you're going to hell. Uh, right? Um, if you're saved, you're born again by the Spirit of God and you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're going to heaven. Whether you agree with me or not on when the, when the rapture is going to take place. Now in our study of this passage thus far, we've examined first of all the proper perspective of what happens when we die. We then examine the pillars of the rapture that Paul gives us here in this passage. The death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then the revelation of Jesus, when, I, when he used that word revelation, he's not talking about his coming, he's talking about his word, that this is the word of the Lord. And that's what he says uh, in, uh, let me see, let me get my place. But well, I'm going to have to read through it. 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jeff, that's right. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So that's what it means by revelation of the Lord. This is by the word. Well, it's not something this Paul came up with. Of course, he's writing this. He's writing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is inspired by God, so it's the word of God. And he's saying this is, comes from God himself. Then next we examine the participants of the rapture, those who will participate in the rapture. They are Christians. Lost people don't participate in the rapture. They're both the living and the dead believers, according to this passage here. It tells us that very cl clearly, that uh, the dead in Christ... The dead in Christ, those who are saved and have died, they will, their bodies will rise, their new bodies will rise to meet their spirit that's coming back with the Lord that he brings with him, as verse number 14 tells us. And then we who are alive and remain, Paul says, will be caught up together with him to meet the Lord uh, in the air. So the participants are both the living and dead believers in Jesus Christ. Then we examine the plan of the rapture. And he lays out a step-by-step -step plan on how the rapture takes place. First he says the Lord himself will come. And he comes for his bride, along with the archangel, I believe is Michael. Then our commander will call all of his troops into formation. The dead in Christ will rise first. The living will be transformed and raised with them to meet the Lord in the air. And then we examine the last point was the prophet of the rapture. What does it profit the church to know this truth? He says in verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. So he's teaching this as an encouraging comfort to the church that... Uh, we're going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be resurrected into new bodies. Amen? Glorified bodies uh, in Christ. That death will not be able to separate us from God. So it gives us encouraging comfort to know that Jesus will keep his promise in John 14, 1, 2, and 3. Where he said he's going to prepare a place for us and he will come again to receive us unto himself. That where he is there we may be also. Tonight I want to conclude this passage with our study on the placement of the rapture or the timing of the rapture of the church. <clears throat> I believe that it is a pre-tribulation rapture uh, of the church because of, and I'm going to show you different things in Scripture tonight and why I, I believe it's that way. Um, John MacArthur writes in his commentary, no solitary text of Scripture makes the entire case for the pre-tribulation rapture. However, when one considers all the New Testament evidence, a very compelling case for the pre-tribulational position emerges, which answers more questions and solves more problems than any other rapture position, end quote. 
Now, the rapture is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, post-tribulationists believe that that's when the rapture happens, that's the second coming, so they combine that together. And pre-trib and mid-trib believers, we don't combine the rapture and the second coming together. We can't because of the way we view it. It happens at different times. It's two different events. Saying that, the rapture is not a coming of Christ to the earth. Okay? So somebody would say, well, if you believe the rapture happens, then that's his second coming, and then the second coming would be his third coming. No, the rapture is not the coming of Christ to the earth. He does not come to the earth at the rapture. It says in this passage, we meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. And Jesus tells us in John, we can be where he is. And to preface that, he said, in his Father's house is what? Many mansions. Right? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am in heaven, there you may be also. He's not talking about earth. He's talking about heaven in that passage. So the rapture is not a coming of Christ to the earth. Okay? So it's not a second coming. The second coming is when Jesus Christ literally and physically returns to this earth. And, and I want to read that in uh, Revelation 1, 7. You don't have to turn with me. i got a lot of scripture to share tonight. If you want to turn with me, you can, but I'm not going to slow down, okay? Because we'll be here a long time if I, if I do. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he is coming, Jesus, with clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So the second coming of Jesus Christ is a literal physical coming because John writes that every eye will see him when he comes. In the passage of the rapture, here in 1 Thessalonians, it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say every eye is going to see him. He's not coming to the earth. He's coming uh, in the sky to, to rapture us and take us out of the earth to meet him. Only the saints of God that are raptured will see him at the rapture. But Jesus' is second coming, he's literally, physically coming. Every eye will see him. Those who pierced him, the Jews, the nation of Israel, will see him as well of when he returns uh, to the earth. I want to take, uh, in doing this, in my studying this, Dr. John MacArthur's commentary on this, uh, on, uh, on uh, this subject, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. He has nine arguments listed in his commentary that present a strong case for a pre-tribulation view. And I want to use his, I'm borrowing his nine points out of his commentary, okay? So I'm going down and telling you, I'm giving him credit right now uh, for that, these nine, because I agree with all of them. And if I didn't agree with them, I wouldn't use them. But I agree with every one of them, and, I'm, and they're biblical, so we're going to look at those things from his commentary. The first thing he says, and the first argument on the pre-tribulation rapture view is the position of the church in the book of Revelation. The position of the church in the book of Revelation. If you look at Revelation, in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the Greek word for church is used 19 times. Greek word for church is used 19 times in chapters 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Revelation. In chapter 1, of course, is when Jesus re reveals himself to John. And he tells John, I want you to write seven letters to seven churches. And in chapters 2 and chapter 3 are those letters to those seven churches. All right? And what happens in chapter number 4? Chapter 4, John is caught up to heaven, to the throne of God. And this is where he's in the throne room of God in chapters 4 and chapter 5. And then chapter 6 through chapter 18, Revelation, covers the tribulation period. It covers the tribulation period. So if the church was on the earth during the tribulation period, if the position of the church was still on the earth during the tribulation, then you would think that, that uh, you would see the church more often during the uh, chapter 6 through 18 than you do. And by the way, every time you see the church in chapter 6 through 18, guess where they are? They're in heaven. They're not on the earth. And I'm going to show you that. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I want you to see something. Go to Revelation with me so you can see this. Revelation chapter 4. John is caught up to heaven. In Revelation chapter 4. He's already written the seven letters to the seven churches. He comes now to chapter 4. And many think this is, a, this is also the teaching of the rapture of the church where he's told to come up here or come up hither in the King James Version. Matter of fact, this is the same exact command in the Greek that is given in chapter 11 of Revelation to the two prophets who will be preaching during the tribulation period. When they are killed, their bodies are laid in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. After the three and a half days are up, they are given this same command John's given, come up here. And they are raptured, resurrected, and then they are caught up to heaven before all the eyes of the world. They will see that happen. Okay? 
So they are literally, physically raptured and resurrected. All the eyes of the world will see these two prophets carried up into heaven uh, during the tribulation period. So it's the same exact command given. So many believe this is the command of the rapture as well, of the church here in chapter 4 of Revelation. Now we get down to verse number, uh, verse number 10 in chapter 4. And we see there's 24 elders... Uh, around a throne. We've already seen them before this in this verse, but here we see the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. At this throne, these 24 elders, are re they represent the raptured church. These 24 elders are representing the church or the saints of God that has been raptured before the tribulation period. Now, this shows us in heaven... At the throne of God, this is when I believe we go to the Bema Seat of Christ, the Judgment Seat of Christ. We're judged for our life, not for our sins. That Jesus did that on the cross. Okay? But we're judged for how we served Him or did not serve Him. And He gives rewards out for those who service is like gold, silver, precious stone, 1 Corinthians 3 tells us. Or if it's like wood, hay, and stubble, it burns up, you don't receive a reward. So these crowns He gives us, we're going to lay them at Jesus' feet. Cast our crowns. Verse 10, we cast our crowns to the throne. Because it is the Lord who's worthy to receive those rewards, not us. We're not worthy to receive anything. He's worthy to receive those rewards. Now, go over to chapter 5. You see these same 24 elders in chapter 5, verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a heart, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song saying, now I want you to listen carefully to this song that these 24 elders are singing. This tells you these are born again Christians. These are not angels. This song tells us these, this is the church. Okay? Listen to this. And where we are. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God. Were angels redeemed to God? No. This is the church. We are the ones redeemed to God. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Which is future tense. It hadn't happened yet. Right? They're at, where are they when they sing this? At the throne of God. It's obvious in chapter 4 and 5 clearly tells us this is the throne of God. <laughs> and we're at the throne of God and we're singing this at the throne of God. So we've been taken out of the world before the throne of God to be able to do this. Right? We're not taken up to heaven and brought immediately to the earth as the post-tribulation this view teaches. It teaches that when Christ comes back at His second coming and then He raptures the church and we come right to the earth with Him. Well, when would this be able to do this right here? And in chronological order of Revelation, this happens right after the seven letters to the seven churches and right before we see the teaching on the tribulation period. In chapter, chapter 6 through chapter 18. And so the 24 elders are in heaven at the throne of God. They're singing the song of redemption. And they're saying, we shall reign. Not we are reigning, but we shall reign on the earth. And this takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, each time we see the elders in chapter 6 through 18, they are at the throne of God in heaven where they are here. All right? Let me show you that. Go to chapter 7, verse 11. Chapter 7, verse 11. And the angel stood around the throne, and the elders, there they are, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones you, who come out of the great tribulation. And washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And so here we see the tribulation saints, the, those who have been martyred. If you read in verses 9 through 11, it tells us that. These are people who were saved during the tribulation period on the earth. They were killed because of their faith in Christ and, re, and they're not... Uh, taking the mark of the beast. 
And so they are killed because of that. Their spirits go before God. This is where they are now. And so this is a great number of them here. And the 24 elders are already at the throne of God, the raptured church. We're already there, right? And so we're there with the angels around the throne of God. And then we see that these come out of the great tribulation. They're at the throne of God. And with the 24 elders, the raptured church is at the throne of God. Now, go to chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh trumpet judgment. Then the seventh angel sounded. There was a loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, here we are, the raptured church, who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be just, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And that happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the, we're in heaven. The second coming hadn't happened yet. This is talking about the second coming. And the 24 elders are at the throne of God, saying this to God the Father. Okay? So it's obvious that we're in heaven here. Now go to chapter 14, verse number 3. Chapter 14, verse number 3. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. From the earth. Okay? So we see the 24 elders in the same position at the throne of God. Now go over to chapter 19, verse 4 through 9. Matter of fact, I'm showing you every time the 24 elders are mentioned in six, chapter 6 through chapter 19. This is every time. You won't find it no more except all these places I'm showing you. Okay, Chapter uh, 19, verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our, praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Who is the wife of the Lamb? The church, right? This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. This is happening in heaven, not on earth. Because verses 11 through 21 detail the second coming of Jesus Christ. This happens in heaven before the second coming of Jesus. Where is the church? Where is the wife? At the marriage supper. In heaven, not on earth. Amen? I mean, it's clear. Can't you see that right there? Very clear to me. It's right there in the passage. So the position of the church in Revelation. We can clearly see that verse, chapters 1, 2, and 3, 19 times the Greek word for churches is used. And they're on earth. And then we get to 4 and 5, we see the church in heaven at the throne of God. And then verse chapter 6 through 18, which describes the tribulation, into chapter 19, every time we see the 24 elders representing the raptured church, they're in heaven at the throne of God. So that's the first argument for a pre-tribulation rapture view. The second argument for a pre-tribulation rapture view that Dr. MacArthur writes in his commentary is the rapture is not mentioned in Revelation 19. There is no mention of a resurrection in this chapter. It goes from hallelujahs and exaltations and adorations and worship of God to the marriage supper of the Lamb to the dressing of the bride in white, right? And then it goes immediately over in verse 11 to the second coming of Jesus. Let me read this to you. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. 
He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Who was the ones previously in this chapter dressed in fine linen, clean and white? The bride, the, 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 the lamb's wife, right? That's what it tells us in this passage, in this chapter. It says that she was made ready. She was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And now we see that we're coming back with Jesus Christ. How can we come back with him from heaven if we're on the earth? Doesn't make sense, does it? It makes sense to say we're in heaven with him, as it says in this passage, and we're returning with him to this earth. He goes on and says this. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds and fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, this is the Antichrist, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Did you see anything about a resurrection in that? No. What I do see is war and wrath and judgment. From God. That's what you see. Right? You don't see nothing about the saints being caught up to meet the Lord in the air or the dead in Christ rising or we being transformed and changed in a moment of twinkling eyes. as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, which that's, that's the rapture he's writing about. He doesn't write about the judgment in that passage. Whenever you see rap, rapture passages, there's no judgment written in those. When you see the second coming passages, you see judgment written. I don't know what to do with that new system back there. So if it gets to hollering, I might have to turn this off. I hope it doesn't do that. Chris came up with me today, and we went through some things. So we, I think we got it okay. Am I too loud, by the way? Okay. Um, all right. So those in attendance at the supper are in heaven and return to Christ at his second coming. We can clearly see that here in this passage of Scripture. So that's the second argument. The rapture, the resurrection is not mentioned in chapter 19, which details the second coming of Jesus Christ. If, listen, the resurrection is important, right? I mean, Jesus taught it in Scripture. The apostles teach it in Scripture. It's taught to us. It's an important act, an event that's going to take place. If it was going to take place at the second coming, you would think it would be mentioned in this passage. Right? It, 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 and it certainly tell us that, hey... We're not in heaven getting married, and I say that symbolically, uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're on earth doing that, right? Because we haven't been raptured. No, we have been raptured, and that's why we're in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb and able to come back with Him when He returns. All right, the third argument for a pre-tribulation viewpoint on the rapture is a post-tribulation rapture renders the rapture concept inconsequential. John MacArthur writes this, God preserves the church during the tribulation as post-tribulationists assert, then why have a rapture at all? It makes no sense to rapture believers from earth to heaven for no apparent purpose other than to return them immediately with Christ to the earth. End quote. That's so true. Isn't it? A post-tribulation rapture would render the separation of the sheep and goats redundant. You know that parable Jesus shares in Matthew 25? He says when he comes, he's going to send the angels out. And they're going to bring all people to him in the second coming. Those who have survived into the tribulation, they survived. Uh, how they survive is only a miracle of God. But they survive, and so he brings all the people that are living on the earth before him. All the angels go and gather those people to him. And he separates the sheep from the goats. He puts the goats on his left hand, the sheep on the right. You know that parable, right? He shares another parable about the tares and the wheat. Right? He says, uh, in, in, the, in the parable, he says that a man sowed a field while, while they slept. And the enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat. And when, they, when the wheat came up, the tares did too. And they said, 
Master, you want us to go and pull up the tares? He says, no, unless you also pull up the wheat. He says, when harvest time comes, I will send the reapers and they will separate the tares from the wheat. The tares will be burned up. The wheat will be stored in the barn. Well, the, the, he said, when he was asked by the disciples, what does that mean? He explains it. He says, it means the, the, that the enemy is the devil. And he comes and sows tares among the kingdom of God, right? And they come up with, the, there's wheat and tares in this earth. Christians and non-Christians, right? And then Jesus says at the end, when he comes back, he's going to send the reapers. He say, and he tells us in that passage, the reapers are the angels. He's going to send and they're going to bring all the people to him and he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. Now, if the rapture of the church was at the second coming, it would be redundant for Jesus to do that because he's, just going to, he's coming to the earth and he's going to separate the believers from the unbelievers that's on the earth at the judgment. Does that make sense? Maybe it, maybe it does. The fourth argument, the population of the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. The population of the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. You know when Christ returns in his second coming, and we come back with him, we rule and reign on the earth with him, people that lived through the tribulation and survived that, they'll still be living if those who trusted in Jesus will. Now those who did not trust in Jesus and survived tribulation, when they're separated at that judgment, he's going to cast them into hell. They're not going to be able to live until the millennial reign of Christ. Only those who are trusting in Christ will live in the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ. Okay? And they will marry, and they will have children. Their children will grow up. They will marry. They will have children. The earth will be repopulated in that way for a thousand years. And then that's how you're going to get a group of people eventually not wanting to follow Jesus. And that's how the devil's going to be able to deceive Many people, when he's released after the thousand years, to turn against Christ. Okay? <clears throat> if all the saints have been raptured, then no one is left to repopulate the earth during his earthly reign. It, in other words, those who believe in a rapture at the second coming, that would mean every Christian who survived the tribulation would be raptured then, and they would be like us in our glorified bodies, and... Um, they would not marry because Jesus says there's no marriage in heaven. Right? So there has to be a pre-tribulation or a mid-tribulation rapture. I would go along with a mid-tribulation before I would a post-tribulation rapture because they've got to be a separate time there for the population of the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. The pre-tribulation rapture allows for this population growth in the reign of Christ on the earth. The saints who will be saved during tribulation or survive it will live into the earthly kingdom still in their earthly bodies. In chapter 20, Revelation, look down with me. Verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This happens at the second coming of Jesus. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the raptured saints. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received his mark on their foreheads, on their hands. This is the tribulation saints that we saw earlier who had died during the tribulation and were in, the, in, uh, in heaven. And they, they, come, we, they come back with us with Christ and their bodies are resurrected. So they reign with Christ as well. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, verse number four says. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God, and of Christ shall reign with him a thousand years. So, this is for the church, the tribulation saints, and also the Old Testament saints, I believe, will be raptured uh, and resurrected when the tribulation saints are at the second coming of Jesus. Now, the fifth argument, I'll put my note 
too quick. The fifth argument is that the tribulation is for Israel and not the church. The seven-year tribulation period is not for the church. It is for the nation Israel. Now, there are some people out there who believe in what is known as replacement theology that teaches that the church has replaced Israel. So all the prophecies of the Old Testament for Israel are now for the church. That is not true. That is not a true teaching. God has not changed his mind about the nation Israel. The promise he gave to Abraham will be fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Israel will have all the land that God promised Abraham. Jesus Christ will reign from the city of Jerusalem. And the tribes of Israel will get their land. And it says it in the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. It tells you even what area of the land they're going to have, each tribe. So the tribulation is not for the church. We don't need to go through the tribulation. Jesus Christ went through the tribulation for us on the cross. Amen? Amen? He was, he was condemned in our place. The judgment and wrath of God was poured out on him in our place. We don't have to go through that. Thank God for it. I want to show you some Old Testament and New Testament passages that to me prove the tribulation, the great tribulation, especially the last three and a half years, is for the nation of Israel, not the church. First of all, the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Listen to this. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, starting there. Daniel given the 70 week, what is known as a 70 week prophecy. 70 week prophecy. Each, the week represents a year in this prophecy. Okay? He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Now, Daniel is writing to Israel. This is not the church. The church didn't even exist when this was written. Amen? So he's writing to Israel, to, to the nation of Israel. This is the prophecy, the 70-week prophecy, and it determines the end of these things. Now he lays it out, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street will be built again and the wall even in trouble sometimes. So he says that from the, the command to restore Israel. When did that happen? The command to restore Israel was given by the Persian king Artaxerxes in 445 B.C. You see, Babylon, God allowed Babylon to conquer Judah and Jerusalem. Right? And they were taken into captivity and they stayed in captivity for 70 years. Then Babylon was conquered by the Medes and Persians. The Persians were more powerful than Medes, but the Medes were aligned with them. So the Persian king, Artaxerxes, gave a decree for the city to be rebuilt. King Cyrus gave the decree for the Jews to be able to go back home to their homeland. That was also prophesied by Isaiah, and God even named Cyrus in that book. Isn't that amazing? Isaiah called Cyrus by name hundreds of years before Cyrus was ever even born. Much less being the king of Persia, right? That tells you God's word is God's word. Amen? And so Artaxerxes gives a command for the city to be rebuilt, and of course the wall has to be rebuilt. That's the book of Nehemiah. The book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, they record the building of the temple, Ezra does, and then the building of the wall and the gates and the streets. Nehemiah records that. And then some of the other minor prophets record the work, how it was lagging and the prophets of God had to speak to the people to get them to work again and finally get the temple uh, rebuilt. And it says in troublesome times, and they had trouble, if you read Nehemiah, they had some trouble trying to do the work with enemies around them. Okay, It says there should be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Remember, these weeks are years. So the seven weeks is 49 years. Nehemiah's day, and that's in Nehemiah's day, rebuilding the walls and streets, as well as also the end of Malachi's ministry. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi prophesied during that time. Then it says also 62 weeks. That's 434 more years for a total of 483 years. Okay, So it's 483 years from the time that King Artaxerxes gives his command to rebuild the streets in Jerusalem and the walls and the city. 483 years from that time, it says, 
uh, until the Messiah the Prince. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Now, when does this happen? When Jesus Christ enters Jerusalem on that donkey on what we call Palm Sunday. So if you did the math, 483 years from the time he said that to the time Christ come in, you get a pretty much pretty good idea of when that took place. And it happened just like Daniel said it was going to happen. The years fell out perfectly, and Christ came back. And then he says the Messiah should be cut off. How is he cut off? He's crucified. He's killed, right? But not for himself. He's not killed for himself. No, he's killed for us, for our sins. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city of the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war desolations are determined. And this is primarily referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is the 70th week of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. The 70th week. He is referring to the Antichrist. He confirms a covenant with many for one week, which is how many years? One week is seven years. A day is a year, right? A one week is seven, so it's seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end. See, in the middle of that seven-year period, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So even Daniel prophesies about what the Antichrist will do in the tribulation period. The final 70th week or seven years will be the time of the Antichrist. Jesus refers to this passage in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the, the last days, the tribulation time, and his second coming. Listen to this, beginning at verse 15, Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Jesus quotes what Daniel said in Daniel 9, which gives great credibility to the book of Daniel as the word of God. If Jesus quotes it, you know it's true. Amen? He says, it's spoken by the Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. So he's talking about, Jesus is, the Antichrist going into the temple in the middle of the tribulation, breaking his covenant he made with Israel, and setting himself up in the temple as God. That's why it's called the abomination of desolation. When this happens, this is what Jesus warns the Jews now. This is not the church he's talking to, okay? This is the Jews. When this happens, when the Antichrist enters the city and he does this, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Judea is Judah. This is where Jerusalem is. You run to the mountains when this happens. You get out of, get out of the town. Get out of Dodge. Amen. <laughs> he says, let him who is on housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. Don't take time to get stuff. You need to leave the city quickly. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. This is how fast you need to get out of town because as soon as the Antichrist comes into that city and sets himself up as God, the 21 judgments of Revelation begin to be poured out on, on the earth. And the Antichrist begins then to have, especially the Jews, persecuted and killed and Christians killed who are living during that time. Then Jesus warns, Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Can you imagine how hard it would be for a pregnant woman or one having a nursing infant to travel quickly? Then he says, pray that your flight may not be in the wintertime. It's harder to travel in the winter than any other time of year. He says, and pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath day because the Jewish tradition, the Sabbath day, you can only travel so far, and that's all. It's not very far, by the way. Then he says, Jesus is speaking now, for then there will be great tribulation. See what Jesus says? This is the last three and a half years of that tribulation period. Great tribulation. Listen to what he says. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were short, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, he's talking about Israel, those days will be shortened. I want to go over to the, the, the old... Uh, Testament, the prophet Zechariah in chapter number 14 and read you some scripture about that day. Chapter 14, Zechariah. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. You see why Jesus tells the people you need to get out of town? 
Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. This is his second coming. And, he, and this is at the battle of Armageddon. As he fights in the day of the battle, in, the day of his, in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Aziel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. In other words, the earthquake is going to take place. The Mount of Olives is going to be split into two, creating a, an escape route for the Israelites from the city of Jerusalem. Thus the Lord my God will come. Now listen to this. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. That means we're with him. And we're coming back with him. That's in Zechariah in the Old Testament. Now, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Now remember, our argument here, the point is, that the, rap, the, the tribulation period is not for the church. It's for Israel. And that's what we've been seeing so far, right? Listen to this. This clearly tells us that the tribulation is for Israel. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great... So that none is like it. Does that sound familiar? We just read what Jesus said and what did he say about that day? There's no, never been a time before like it, nor ever will be again. If it wasn't shortened, even the whole nation of Israel will be destroyed. Right? Jeremiah says that day is great, there's none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Israel. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to who? Israel. Jacob is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. He is clearly saying that that day, that time, that no other times like it, which is in agreement with Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24 of the tribulation, especially the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, that is the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. But, uh, the Jeremiah the prophet says, he shall be saved out of it. God's going to save Israel out of that. The sixth argument for a pre-tribulation view of the rapture is the Thessalonian Christians that we've been looking at in Thessalonians. They think they missed the rapture, remember? They were worried about those who died. Where are they? Have we met? We, they were suffering for their faith, so they thought they were living in the tribulation. They would missed the rapture. So if they thought they had missed the rapture and they were living in the tribulation, that presupposes or implies that the rapture does happen before the tribulation period. Because if they believed that the rapture happened at the second coming, they wouldn't be worried about it. They would be glad and joyful they were in tribulation, thinking that the rapture is about to happen at the end of the tribulation period. But they were confused about that. They feared they were in that, and they'd missed the rapture. So Paul, Paul wrote that passage to comfort them. John MacArthur writes, if the rapture precedes the tribulation, they might have wondered when believers who died would receive their resurrection bodies. But there would have been no such confusion if the rapture follows the tribulation. All believers would then receive their resurrection bodies at the same time. Further, if they had been taught that they would go through the tribulation, they would not have grieved for those who died, but rather would have been glad to see them spared from that horrible time. End quote. So it makes sense because of their confusion about it that the rapture happens before the tribulation, not after. The seventh argument, the sequence of events at Christ's coming, at his second coming. At the rapture of the church, Jesus gathers his own to himself. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, um, uh, Revelation chapter number uh, 4, as we looked at that. And in the verses after that, it showed the elders of the church in heaven with Christ. But at his second coming, the angels gather the elect. At the rapture, resurrection is prominent. But when it, we see scriptures regarding the second coming, the resurrection is not mentioned. We saw that in chapter 19 Revelation, right? At the rapture, Christ comes to reward believers, but at the second coming, He comes to judge the earth. You don't find rewarding verses on the day of the Lord. You find judging verses on the day of the Lord. The only thing you see rewarding really is telling us we're going to rule and reign with him after that. At the rapture, the Lord snatches away true believers from the earth, but at the second coming, he takes away unbelievers from the earth. 
when he separates the sheep from the goat and the wheat from the tares. At the rapture, Scripture does not mention the establishments of Christ's kingdom. But the second coming, Christ will set up his earthly kingdom. So you can see the differences in those passages when you see those taught that way. The eighth argument for a pre-tribulation rapture view, Jesus teaches teachings demand a pre-tribulation rapture. We saw that about the, um, the sheep and the goat, right? The, the uh, wheat and the tares, Matthew 13 tells us about that. And then listen to this one in Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind of fish, which when it was full, they drew to shore. They sat down and gathered the good in the vessels, but threw the bad away. So he says in the story, these fishermen cast this great net into the sea, and when the net gets full, they drag it in, and they sit down, and they go through the fish, their catch. They keep the good ones, and the bad fish they throw out. They separate them, right? That's a separation, just like the sheep and the goat, just like the wheat and the tares. Jesus continues in Matthew 13, 49. So it shall be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So that must occur at the second coming of Jesus to harmonize with all the other scriptures that talk about him sending out angels to gather these people together, both saved and lost, good and bad, right? And separating them. That's not the rapture. That's at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture scriptures we look at only talk about the ones who are saved and they're taken out of the earth. The rapture passages shows us being snatched away from earth, not on the earth and then separated on the earth from unbelievers. Finally, this last argument that he shares in his commentary is Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. You still in Revelation? Are y'all still in Revelation? If you're not, let's go back there to chapter 3, verse 10. Remember chapter 3, 2 and 3 are letters to the seven churches. Uh, this is in the letter to the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 3, verse 10. And Jesus, Jesus says this to that church. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the, watch this, whole world. Not just in the city of Philadelphia, if this was just for the church in Philadelphia, he wouldn't have said the whole world, right? Just He would just be talking about those in Philadelphia. If it was just in the region Philadelphia was in, which is what was back then called Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, he would just say it, that area. But he said this hour of trial is coming on the whole world. What hour of trial is coming on the whole world? The tribulation. Primarily the great tribulation. Remember Jeremiah? This is a time of trouble that there's been no time like it before. And Jesus in Matthew 24, there's never been a time like this and there will be again. That's how bad it's going to be. And so here Jesus is saying, I will keep you from the hour of trial which come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth. He says, I'm going to keep you, the church, from this hour of trial as he's testing those on the earth. They're not going to go. So he's telling the church, you're not going to go through this testing. That's what he's saying. In the Greek, as this is originally written, the phrase, I also will keep you from, can mean nothing other than, I will prevent you from entering into it. I'm going to prevent the church from entering into this hour of trial that comes on the whole world. Jesus Christ will honor his bride by preventing her from entering into Daniel's 70th week, the seven-year tribulation period, which is the hour of trial the Great Tribulation, also known as Jacob's Trouble in the Scriptures. Before the wrath of God comes upon the world during the Great Tribulation, Christ will remove His bride. It's been said by others before, and I want to say it tonight. Jesus is not going to allow His bride to be beat up before He comes and gets her. He's going to take her out of this world and then the Tribulation is for Israel. Just as God kept Noah in the ark and then judged the earth, just as God sent the angels for Lot and told them to get out of Sodom and then he burned down the cities. Just as he did that, he's going to do the church the same way. He's going to take the church out 
And then he's going to send his judgments during that tribulation time. Amen? So, now, whether you watch this video and you disagree with me, that's your right to do that. You have every right to be wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with anybody, so if any of y'all watch this on YouTube and you decide you want to share your views under the comments, that's fine. You can do that. You have every right to do that. We still live in America, and I'm an American. I believe in our freedoms to do that, that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to get into a banter with you, a back and forth. I have preached this and shared this over several weeks. You're welcome to watch all these videos. If you disagree, that's your prerogative. I'm not going to argue with you about it. Amen? I do love you, though, and I want you to know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior because that's how we get to heaven. Whether we raptured before, in the middle, or after, whatever you believe, we've got to be saved to be able to be raptured. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for this opportunity to be together again in this place to study the Scriptures together. And Lord, I firmly believe just at the study of your word, Jesus, that you will rapture your church prior to the tribulation period. And I thank you for the promise of the rapture, the promise of the resurrection of the saints of God, that you will raise us and give us new glorified bodies that we will be with you forever. And we will come back with you to this world to rule and reign with you in this, on this earth for a thousand years. And we will spend eternity with you, Lord, worshiping you, praising you, glorifying you, and serving you. Thank you for that. Help us, Lord, as Christians to live in this world now as your ambassadors, to show your love, your grace to people, and to speak the truth in love to others. Have your way in our hearts. Be with us as we travel home. Give us travel grace and mercy. If there's some watching this video that's lost, I pray in the name of Jesus tonight, God, you know where they are. You know their condition before you, God. I humbly ask, Lord, that you would awaken their hearts to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would realize the seriousness of their sins before you, a holy, righteous God. You created them in your image. You made them for yourself. Help them, Lord, to turn to you, Jesus, in repentance of their sins and faith in you and you alone, Jesus, and what you did on Calvary's cross for them. By going to the cross, substituting yourself in our place, bearing our sins and iniquities on your body, taking the judgment and wrath of God for us on that cross, that we could be saved from his wrath. That person is watching and listening, and I pray you break in their hearts, they would turn to you in prayer right now and ask you to forgive them and to save them, Lord. And they would become one of your children. Thank you for who you are and all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.